I want to invite you to join us today in this message called When Grace Reigns in the Darkness. I think this is an incredibly important message that everybody needs to hear, and you can hear it in its entirety at impactministries.com. You see, we are coming into the time when the Bible says that darkness will cover the face of the earth, but he will come upon us and we will be a light to the Gentiles in this darkness. I want you to understand something. Most of what's been taught about grace today, it will not get people through difficulty. It will not get people through hard times. It's a feel-good message that has elements of the truth, but it does not empower you to live a righteous life. I want you to realize that as grace works in your life, and I'm going to share this with you today, you're going to understand how no matter what's going on in the world, you can be a light in the darkness. You can experience God in this situation. You can experience the power to overcome, and you can still be an influence on the people around you. You want to hear this message. This six CD series that you're going to hear called When Grace Reigns and Darkness Prevails is one of the most practical teachings you're ever going to get about what's really happening in the world, about how things are going to unfold, and about how you as a believer can stand strong and live in victory no matter what happens. It's going to open your understanding on grace. It's going to open your understanding on end time events. And it is going to equip you to be a light in the darkness and to have strength when everybody else is failing. Isaiah 60 gives us this stern warning that a time will come when darkness will cover the earth and darkness will cover the people, but that his glory will rest on us, his glory will abide on us, and we will be a light in the darkness. That's exactly what Jesus told us. He told us that we are the light of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. Listen, I want you to understand something. We're talking about grace in a time when darkness will prevail. There is no getting around this. We've talked about the normalcy bias. We've talked about the fact that we tried to create doctrines. We've tried to explain it away. And we've tried to convince ourselves that we'd never see it in our lifetimes. But the real truth is grace is exploding in the earth, but at the same time, darkness is exploding in the earth. And I want you to be totally equipped to know how to overcome circumstances, to not let your life be controlled by circumstances. And so you've got to understand grace from a purely biblical perspective and not from some of the, some of the pop culture that's being taught now in the name of grace because I got news for you, that stuff won't get you through anything. You got to be rooted and grounded in the word of God and in the life of Jesus. I want you to realize that grace and the power of the Holy Spirit are pretty much one and the same thing. You know, uh, Pentecostals use the term anointing. Pentecostals and charismatics use the term anointing. Now today people are using the term grace. But when you realize that grace is a power, it's a strength, it's a capacity, it makes you able to do things, you realize that this is probably synonymous with the power of the Holy Spirit. And actually the Bible bears this out. But I want you to understand something. Jesus did all that he did by the grace of God. It says Jesus was covered over and permeated with grace. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I want you to realize, uh, when it talks about Jesus and having grace on him, it always connects grace and truth together because there is no grace apart from truth. And when you leave the truth of God's word, you leave the realm of grace because grace makes you able to live and to function in the truth. So it says in John 1, 16, it says, And of, of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. And then it says the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now I want you to understand that because the grace of God was operating in Jesus, he was able to show us what God looked like. You know what? That's exactly what should be happening in our lives. As believers who are filled with the grace of God, as believers who know the truth, we should be manifesting God to the world. You know, the Apostle Paul says in the first chapter of Colossians, he says that when grace is, is preached in truth and when it's believed, 
that it always brings forth fruit. There is no concept in the New Testament of grace just being a position. You know, I hear people say, well, Jesus is grace. No, he's not. Jesus is our Lord. Grace is the power of God that worked in Jesus. Uh, uh, you know, I hear people talking about this need for the message of grace to go to the world. Well, no, actually, it's the message of the kingdom that needs to go to the world. Grace is just a spoke in a wheel of very important things that we need to know, believe, and experience. But unfortunately, we have made, made grace the be-all and end-all, which means really it's just become a doctrine that we talk about that is not really in power in our life. In Acts 10, 38, it talks about, it says this, which is interesting. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So you see these interchangeable terms of Jesus being anointed with the Holy Ghost and being filled with grace. And you start realizing that when the Holy Spirit manifests himself, that is a work of grace. As a matter of fact, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the word gifts, comes from the Greek root word charis, charismata. And, and that's, that's where the word charismatic came from, for the charismatic move, because they place an emphasis on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So when you realize that the, that the root of the word gifts of the Holy Spirit really is more related to the grace of the Holy Spirit, you start realizing that when the Holy Spirit manifests himself or his power through anybody to overcome sin, to prophesy, to get people healed, to work miracles, to speak in tongues, or, or have a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, any of those things that, that are manifestations of the person of God are always a work of grace. Now, Jesus is our model of who we are as sons of God and what we can do. And we should look to him to understand how to live in a world full of darkness. Now, I want you to realize there are people today that in the name of grace are saying you can't follow the teachings of Jesus because some people say, well, he, was, he came only to the lost sheep of Israel. And, some people, and, and he did say that. And that was all his personal ministry was too. But his teaching was for the world because he clearly told his disciples that they should go out and that they should make people disciples by teaching them to obey everything that he commanded. So when somebody tells you you can't follow Jesus' teaching, what they're doing is they're alienating you from Jesus as your personal Lord. And they're alienating you from understanding God. And the real truth is the only reason they tell you that is because they don't understand the teachings of Jesus. They, they really don't know what it is they're talking about. They're good people. They preach good messages. They have some good things to say. But I'm going to tell you, when somebody starts trying to alienate you from Jesus and his teaching and his life and his ministry, you better turn off the tape, shut down the computer, turn off the television, and run in another direction because they're taking you somewhere you want to do it, don't want to go. Hebrews 5.9 says this, He, speaking of Jesus, became the author of eternal salvations to all who obey him. This was written in the epistles. Obedience is not legalism. He is our Lord and our Savior, and salvation includes more than getting your sins forgiven. Salvation includes deliverance from circumstances that are around you. It includes healing and health and all of these things. But he leads us into those things because we follow him. This is not a legalistic obedience. This is not trying to earn something from God. It's because God is always our shepherd and trying to lead us into life uh, the way it should be. And you can only be led if you're willing to obey, if you're willing to follow him. Matter of fact, that word obey means to hear as a subordinate, to listen attentively, attentively and by implication to heed or to conform to a command or authority. I want to tell you something. Jesus is our Lord. This is the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of grace. The gospel of the kingdom is where there is a king, there is a Lord, there are, are laws that work in the kingdom, and they're not burdensome laws. They're not to, to make you righteous or make you earn anything, but they are to bring you into the provisions that are ours in this kingdom realm. Hebrews 12, 1 says this, let us run our race with endurance or patience. Uh, or let's run with endurance or patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm telling you what, we have to look to him. We, you know, uh, 
endurance or patience is the ability to stand under pressure and not waver. Well, I want you to realize we can't walk through what's coming on the world without wavering if we are not intimately connected to Jesus, experiencing the grace of God, but also experiencing his leadership. I want you to realize most people lose their minds and go crazy, not just because of how hard things are. People lose their minds. People come unravel. People start doing desperate things because they don't have guidance. They don't know what to do next. And they, their desperation leads them to start making crazy, desperate decisions. And before you know it, man, they're, they're off the rails into, into some kind of mess that they can't get out of. You see, we want to be intimately connected to him to, because our ability to stand without wavering is greatly and largely connected to the fact that we have leadership. We have guidance. His Holy Spirit is showing us where to go and, and, and how to get there. You know, in looking to Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, remember, he went through everything that we'll ever go through, and he didn't sin. In other words, he didn't cave in to seeing himself as less than he really was in God. I don't think we're really very realistic about the world that Jesus was born into and, and, how, and, and what we can learn from him. You know, he was born into the Roman Empire, one of the most treacherous, tyrannical governments uh, of the entire world. And in this government, there was no justice. The elite, the elite were privileged and there wasn't much of a middle class and the poor were really there just to serve the whims of the elite. Justice was pretty much un unheard of. Slavery was common. You could, be, you could be forced into slavery. You could be going to slavery because you owed debts. And once you became a slave, you were forced to do anything your master required, anything, any kind of sexual deed, any kind of perversion, murder, self-annihilation, anything your master wanted you to do for his or her pleasure, you had to do. The Roman world was a polytheistic world with an emphasis on emperor worship. In other words, you, you you had to pledge, you could worship any gods you wanted to worship, but you had to pledge your highest allegiance to Rome. And if you didn't pledge your highest allegiance to Rome, you would be killed. Uh, unwanted babies, you know, we, we look at abortion and what an atrocity it is today. In the Roman world, if you had a baby girl and you wanted a son, or if you had a baby and you didn't like the way it looked, or if it had something wrong with it, they would basically just take their babies and put them in the city dump to die much more brutal than, than what we're seeing today. Cult worship involved temple prostitutes. And this is where the term sodomites came from. Sodomites were temple prostitutes. And so if your children participated in, in any, of the, any of the activities at their local temple, they may be introduced to all kinds of sexual perversion at a very, very early age. The masses of the people were poor. They were oppressed by the elite ruling class. Many of them uh, barely lived. They had, many had to be dishonest and still and be unscrupulous just to find ways to live. There were no civil rights. Uh, man, you're talking about uh, women and minorities being oppressed. Everybody was oppressed except the ruling class. He was born into gross darkness, yet because he yielded to God and allowed the grace of God to work in him, he was able to to go through all of, all of that, to face all of that, and do it without wavering, doing it, doing it without losing his sense of who he was in relationship to God. He was able to maintain his identity and his spiritual internal strength and stamina. And not only that, he brought light into the darkness. Now, we have the same spirit of grace that he had, and in fact, we have resurrection power at work in us. Now, remember, grace is one of those heart words. And, and again, there are people that are trying to just kind of present grace as a feel-good state of being where God just does everything and, and you don't really have to do anything because if you did anything, it would be works. Well, the Bible never said that we're free from works. It says we're free from dead works, but we are His workmanship created unto good works. And let me encourage you, if you've never taken our Foundations of Faith class, it's for free on our, on our website. It's one of the most important classes you'll ever take. Thousands of people have taken it and gotten them a firm foundation and, and really got out of all the crazy doctrinal goofiness that has, that has been perpetuated or has been introduced into the world today. Grace is one of those heart words. It's a continuum of, of, of first of all, truth, 
and then embraced by faith and a power that you experience, and then it's expressed in the life that you live. So grace, is, grace can't just be, because it's a continuum, it can't just be defined uh, in, in, as a one-dimensional uh, static type of concept. It is a continuum that, that starts with the truth of God's Word that goes all the way through uh, our, our being to where we, have, we, we, we take it by faith, we, we, we trust God, we believe what God says about us, we experience this power, and then that changes everything about how we feel, and that changes everything about how we live. Now, in the Old Testament, people experienced the grace of God through the anointing, and that anointing would come and go. But in the New Covenant, we have the Holy Spirit in us so that He is always seeking to manifest Himself through us with the life and the power of God. You know, in the Old Covenant, they had to seek God to experience grace or anointing. But in the New Covenant, we have to resist God to keep from experiencing power. Because God's in us all the time. The anointing doesn't come and go. We share in His anointing, and we have to resist God uh, in order to fail. We have to resist God in order to fall into sin. We have to resist God in order to make a bad, uh, a bad decision. We have to resist God for things not to work in our life. Now, I want you to understand something. There is not, nor has there ever been, any concept of grace as it is being taught today by many of the so-called grace teachers. There is not nor has there ever been a biblical basis for grace, meaning that it's all right to sin, that it's all right to be irresponsible, that it's all right to live a, a, a reckless life, or that we, are, that we are free from serving God, that we are free from walking with God. There's never been a biblical basis to reject the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there has never been a biblical basis for rejecting the Word of God in the Old Testament. See, there's a difference between the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. The Old Testament is a body of truth. And remember, the first five books of the Bible were spoken directly from the mouth of God to Moses. How are we going to say that that's not applicable? Everything that the apostles taught in all of the New Testament, they got out of the first five books of the Bible. If we would believe those, those, those books and understand them instead of reject them in our ignorance, we would have a better understanding of what Jesus has done for us and what, what we have today. Now, I want you to understand there have been cults throughout the years that have taught the kind of foolishness that's being taught today and they all end in self-destruction. You see, grace starts with personal faith and trust. Salvation, every aspect of what we have in God is a work of grace through faith. There is no separating grace from faith. And faith is is trust in God's word and God personally. And it's a trust where, where because we believe who God is, we believe what God says. Now, I want you to understand something. God's word and God's name are, are synonymous. As a matter of fact, the psalmist says in Psalm 138 too, he says, you have magnified your word above all your name. In the NIV, it says, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. In the Amplified, it says, you have exalted above all else your name and your word, and you have magnified your word above all your name. However, whatever translation you read, it gets down to this. God's name is as only as good as God's word. And when you reject God's word, you reject God's name. When you reject God's word, you take the name of the Lord vainly or in vain. Now, you see, we only trust and reverence God to the degree that we trust and reverence his word. And, and, I, and you know, I understand that, that people have misused this. I understand there have been abuses in the past. But sadly, almost every movement that comes along is, a rea is, a, is an overreaction to the abuses of, of some truth from the past. And so today, people are throwing away the Word of God, and you know they're rejecting, they're rejecting the teachings of Jesus. They're rejecting the Old Testament. They're saying that the book of Revelation has only been 
has already been fulfilled in some mystical way that we don't understand. And then the books of the New Testament that they don't like, like the book of James and, and some things that Peter said, then they reject that and basically just selecting the parts of the Word of God that support what they believe because they have made up their mind what they believe. They are not letting the Bible talk to them. They are talking to the Bible. And Listen, God's word is incredible. You read where the psalmist, these different people talk about how much they love God's word. God's word is true. God's word is proven. God's word is tried. God's word is tested. God's word is a shield. God's word is wisdom. And you realize that these are people that trusted God and trusted what he said. And the reason they had this value for the word was not because they were legalists. It was because they realized God was so much smarter than they were and that by learning how his word could be applied to their life, they could live in a wisdom that was beyond their wisdom. They could live in a quality of life that was beyond what they had the capacity to develop themselves. I want you to realize God's word is impossible to implement on any consistent basis without grace. And one of the best ways I like to understand how grace and faith work together is when you look at some of the miracles of Jesus. You know, Jesus would walk down the road and he'd say to a cripple, rise up and walk. Now, that's interesting because he was telling them to do what they were physically incapable of doing. Now, they could have said, they could have, and I'm actually sure that many of them did, come up with an excuse for not getting up. After all, they were crippled. You know, they could have sat there and said, what are you, are you crazy? I can't get up, I can't do this, you know? And basically, they, they would have stayed crippled. Or they could have come up with a doctrine that justified them not attempting to do anything. Uh, you know, this is how the carnal mind works. When the carnal mind is challenged to accept life different than it has seen it, when the carnal mind is challenged to really face being wrong in any area, it finds excuses, explanations, and even creates doctrines so that it can feel comfortable in doubt and unbelief. So that it can feel comfortable and choose a, 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 a lesser life over the life that God's offering. Now the person that trusts, however, experiences a strength, a capacity, a power that works in their heart comes by unmerited favor, and it makes them able. Able to do what? Able to do what the Word says. You see, this is the grace that will reign in you as an individual, even though darkness is prevailing over the entire earth. Now, I want you to understand something. I can't, there, there's so much I, I want to go into. I, I, you really need to get this entire six CD series, When Grace Reigns and Darkness Prevails, because I go into the nuts and bolts of this in ways that, you, that we just can't cover in this broadcast. But I want you to understand something. Once you throw away the Word of God, there is nothing for grace to work with in your heart because grace always works through faith. Faith is trust in God, which means you trust what God says. So the minute you remove yourself from trusting the Word of God because of who God is, trusting His promises because of what Jesus has done, the, mo the, the moment you move away from accepting the responsibility to personally trust God and then act on it. You see, whenever Jesus would say to that cripple, stand up and walk, at some point, no matter what went on inside of him, it would be dead faith if he didn't act on it. At some point, he had to stand up and say, because I believe, th believe this, I'm going to do this. And they would stand up. And I tell you, I've seen people all over the world get miracles that are beyond anything you've ever been able to imagine because whenever I would speak the word of God, to them, they would make a decision to act based on the fact that they chose to believe. Grace comes alive inside you because you believe the truth. But when you reject the truth, when you reject God's word, then there is nothing for grace to work with. Listen, I want you to come back from our mentoring moment. I'm going to share some practical things about how to put this to work in your life. Man, I hope you've downloaded our brand new app. And if you have the old app, be sure and delete it and get the new one. I just got a message from somebody today just telling me how much they appreciated all the free things that are on our website, all the teaching that they get, all the benefits they get, and that they're able to access all of this 
through their phone and through their tablet. They don't even have to sit down at a computer. They can do it while they're in an airport. They can do it anywhere. And also, it makes it possible for everybody in the family to individually watch the program, get the magazine, get all the quotes, all of those things that are such a blessing to so many people. And be sure, by the way, and join us for World Changer Weekend. This year, we're inviting People who are not a part of our World Changer family, if you want to come, you can come. Our World Changers are hosted. There is no registration fee, but you do have to register. Go to impactministries.com or call our office and talk to somebody. Get your name on the list if you're planning to come because we only have a limited space. My new series, When Grace Reigns and Darkness Prevails, is going to equip you to be able to walk in the grace, power, ability, and capacity of God in any situation whether we're facing the end or whether we're just facing incredibly difficult financial times, you need to have the power of God working inside you. And you're going to understand the nuts and bolts of what's going on in the world more than you've ever understood it. And you're going to be able to avoid the entrapments that are coming on planet Earth because the grace of God is going to strengthen you. As you've gathered from this program, this, is, this program is talking about how to connect through the grace of God through faith, which means through the Word of God. In other words, God and His Word are synonymous. Faith is when you trust God, therefore you trust what He says, and faith causes grace to come alive inside of us. Listen, you want to have a life of reading God's Word and asking the Holy Spirit to show you how to apply it to your own life. You know, the problem is we're usually reading the, the Word of God to try to find information, or some people are just paying, they're paying premiums on their fire insurance or just trying to do what they're obligated to do. Every aspect of the Word of God, you want to be reading and saying, how does this apply to my life? How do I put this into practice? And then that's when you meditate on it. You know, one of the things that has helped me so much in my life was for years and years, I would read one chapter of Proverbs every day because Proverbs is all about practical application. And every day as I would read through these Proverbs, I would read all of these practical verses and say, God, how, how would this look in my life? What would this look like? How would I put this in practice? Where do I need to use this? And I would use my imagination to see myself uh, uh, controlling my tongue, to see myself uh, uh, controlling who I communicate it with. I'm not talking about controlling anybody else, but to see myself using wisdom is really the proper term of who I talk to and how I communicate it, how I manage money, how I manage my businesses, how I, how I manage my life, how I manage my relationships. And the great thing was because you commit yourself to God and, and you rely on Him then you experience the grace to be able to do this. You see, if it's anywhere in the Word of God, you can experience the grace to do whatever it says to do. And remember, Jesus did not come and bring us new truth. In other words, he, he didn't say, okay, don't read the Old Testament anymore. That's what, got, that's what has gotten the church into error for the last 2,000 years is because they don't understand the Old Testament. But instead... What he did is he showed us what the Old Testament would have looked like if it was applied from the basis of love. He brought us grace and truth. He didn't bring us a new truth. He brought us the truth of what God had already said and gave us the power and the ability to do it. So the wisdom of Proverbs, it'll work in your life by the grace of God.